Uh, Paul, we're just talking about um, you know being very very successful as a coach. And in, in the time at Parramatta, I was just wondering if you could actually tell us who you thought, you know, maybe one or two players who you thought were the best players. I mean, each player has different abilities. That, uh, you know, they're prepared. You know, you need your workers. You need your ones that kick the goals. You need the people that are going to lift your team. That you know, a, a team makes thing. But who who would who would you rate as the best player you've coached or helped or whatever? I mean, you talked about Andrew Leeds moving from five eight to fullback. Is he the best player that you've ever coached, or or is the best player like you know Brad Selby, who probably didn't ever realise his his full potential? Hmm. Yeah, I mean that's a good question and a hard one to answer. Um, I know when coaching, I never like to single anyone out, but um, in this situation, talent-wise, Brad Selby would be the best player, no doubt about that. A freak. I rated him better than Mark Eller. Yeah, I, I, I played. I saw year. him play in a sevens competition one year for Parramatta against Ramwick at Kiama, and he made Mark Eller look silly, and I mean that. Um, Brad um, wasn't the easiest guy to uh, to coach. He was pretty set in his ways, but um, we had a sit down one time and I just told him the facts and if he wanted to be part of the team, well, he had to change a few things and he did. And um, so, but other than that, you know, it was a team in those two years that we won the grand final. You know, it was a team. It was a very well-balanced side. It was a side that got on very well individually. Um, but, you know, Andrew Leeds was another very good player. And, you know, I mean, Tiny Melrose was a great leader of men. So um, if you had to single anyone out, you'd probably say, well, those three, but, you know. But you brought, you brought uh, Neil Cat through from virtually fourth grade yeah. to first grade and he ended up yeah. getting a goal in 85. I mean, and Neil was a, I think he's another better New South Wales player too in, in schoolboys. Yeah, say. there was Neil Cat and Mick Carter. Mick Carter played for New South Wales. They were two very good, strong, hard centres. Yeah, you no, know, Neil was a very good player. Yeah. So it's a, it's just an interesting with, with all of those, you know, and it, so at the end of the year you had Butch Walker in that la in your eighty three and things like that. So it's a, it's a interesting way of about how players relate and all those things. The next part from there was the success was rewarded with being um, chosen to, to be the New South Wales coach. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, after the um, eighty six grand final, I guess it was time for me to look at something else and um, give someone else a go at coaching Parramatta. Um, Alan Jones, I guess, was instrumental in getting me to coach New South Wales. Um, probably more than instrumental. I'd say he got me the job. He also got me rid of the, out of the job as well. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so um, I nominated, as you have to do, and I think there may have been two other candidates, and uh, I was lucky enough to, to get New South Wales. So that was a new ball game. Um, I probably inherited a very good side. And uh, the uh, incumbent captain was Simon Poitivan. So um, I had uh, two selectors with me that, that would pick the side and it was unanimous that Simon Poitivan wasn't the captain or wasn't going to be the captain that we all agreed Nick Far jones was. So that soon made the media and... Um, once it did, all hell broke loose. I think it was more Simon um, beating up the media to um, maybe I should uh, have a look at this and reevaluate and so on and so forth. That particular time I was in Japan, my wife rang me to tell me what was happening. I got on a plane, came home, met Ross Turnbull at Concord Oval, and we worked out how we were going to approach it. And that was done by having a meeting at the bowling club across the road from Concord with all the players where I got up in front of them and met most of them for the first time and said why the meeting was happening and what I want you to do is hands up for those that want Far Jones and hands up for those that want Simon Poitivan. So they couldn't hide and it was unanimous, Far Jones. That's so um, as we were leaving Simon Poitivan, um, well, I guess, yes, he had tears in his eyes, but he came over and he said, um, I'll be your best player in New Zealand when we play Christchurch. And that was our first game, and we won in Christchurch, and he was the best player. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what was your record with New South Wales then? Like, how many wins? Um, yeah, pretty good. Uh, we lost um, to Auckland, but that Auckland side was an all-black side. You know, there was 15 players, and I think there were 14 all-blacks in that side. 
and they beat us by two points at Concord Oval, so that was one loss, and we lost to Queensland in Queensland, but we beat them on the return game at, at Concord, so we won the others, yeah. So I guess getting back to, and I won't talk about the, the next couple of years, but what's the cultural things, the difference in, say, with Parramatta? What, you know, you've coached a lot of you know, southern districts and you know, I know you work with Sydney Union and things like that. What what makes a good team? What makes a good cultural difference or to, to, to lift, to, to have a belief that they can do it, to, to make men, you know, rise above, rise above it? I mean, you, you're a good man manager, what what makes the difference? You think, you, you know, like to, to bring the well, best out into it. <clears throat> Look, I think in my case, I may have been a bit lucky. I inherited a very good young side that had come through the Parramatta district, um, and they were all successful. A lot of them came from the Black Town, the Seven Hills, but they were all very successful teams in their age group. They'd been mates right through school. So really when I got the side, they all knew each other. Their partners knew each other. And it was from there, I just built a family, you know. Mm -hmm. I always included the, the partner of the player and everything that we did, you know. On a Sunday, we'd make sure that we'd have a team barbecue. The girls would be invited. So I tried to create a very happy family environment because on top of that, I was fairly... I, well, I'll use the word hard on how we trained, when we trained very hard on discipline, what time you arrive and so on and so forth. So they had to give a lot and they were willing to give a lot and the results just came. But I think we probably came from a working class area and that's what where, I'm... you know, they'd grown up with no heirs or fairs, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They weren't given... The silver spoon wasn't in their mouth. They always had to work hard to get where they were today. And I really think that played in our hands and we just grew from there. And um, I didn't give them the talent. They were born with the talent. I just moulded it. But they were a very, very good football side. I guess then from then, you, you were virtually one of the first professional coaches of the coaching era. It had been fully paid by Southern Districts. That, did they headhunt you? Yeah, they headhunted me. After the New South Wales game? They headhunted me and chased me and threw the dollars at me. And At that time, I suppose it all looked good, but in hindsight, it was probably a pretty dumb decision. Uh, Paul, you would just say that when you went to Southern District, you thought it was, might in hindsight, now a dumb decision. What made you feel that way? Well, I got involved with two people that were actually putting up the money. I mean, they were rugby people. They were stalwarts of Port Hacking Club. Um, Southern Districts was an amalgamation of St George and Port Hacking. So they were two Port, Port Hacking people that um, in their own rights were both very wealthy people. And that's where the money was coming from. But they also had their own thoughts on how Southern Districts should be run and so on and so forth. And I guess at the end of the day, I had my ideas of how things should be done as well and they clashed so you know if if um, those things don't work out when the employer and the employee um, don't get on well the results aren't good I mean we had some good results when we um, when we played as the, as the team but off the field yeah. it wasn't very good I guess the, the, the last part now is that you finished with Newcastle is that right or yeah, I finished. I moved out of Sydney and uh, moved up um, just out of uh, Heather Bray or a place called Madawi, which people probably should know. It's, it's um, just out of Raymond Terrace. And I wasn't doing anything. And the um, this particular job came up and I applied and um, went through the, the interviews and was given the, the job of, um, of coach. But um, very amateurish. I'm trying to be kind here. Uh, yeah, very amateurish. Uh, a run organisation, and at the end of the day, I was hung out to dry. And so, you know. And that was, was just that, that was '96. That was your last year then. Yeah, that was the last year. Yeah, I'd had enough by then. So you haven't. Um, you've never coached since. Never coached. Never had the desire to coach. Um, 
I have been approached up here with the Tari area to coach both Old Bar and Tari, but I didn't have the drive or the inclination. Um, you know, I'm not one to put the toe in. I'm either in or I'm out. So uh, I think I've had a good innings and I'm quite happy to retire on that. Well, that sounds good. Uh, well, let's talk about a couple of characters. Can we talk about Muncher? <laughs> yeah, Dennis Garlic, um, better known as Muncher. Um, yeah, great man. Known him for a lot of years and his partner, Helen. Um, yeah, I, I look, words probably fail me to, to really say what sort of a bloke, a bit of an unassuming sort of a guy, you know, uh, loves to wear sand shoes, wear volleys, yeah, his volleys, yeah, his volleys, and, um, but a dedicated man, um, would, um, would give you his last two dollars if, if he had to, uh, dedicated to his job, um, very fond memories of him playing, and, um, <laughs> always trying to hit his head on the ground to make sure that he looked tough because he had blood running from his head. As long as you weren't in front of him when he walked on you. Yeah? But, uh, uh, yeah, no, a, a great character. Great character. Is there any other highlights that you, in your time with Parramatta or the rugby that you want to mention or, or um, you know, come to mind that think or that's about it? Not really that come to mind. You know, I just think that when someone puts his mind to something and achieves it, I guess winning back-to-back -back is, you know, in my sporting career or history is, is what it's all about. You know, we, we climbed the mountain and that was the goal and I've achieved it. And I think if you look through the records of any sport, and I say any sport, back-to-back -back premierships don't come easy. Okay, I guess now that you're, you're, you're living in Tari, you know, I know you're playing golf and you're off the stick at you know, 16, which is not bad. 15, uh, thanks. Oh, 15. Um, can you tell us about your greyhounds? Oh, that, that's a fairly good story. They are you retired. I mean, do you actually coerce those greyhounds and talk to them? Like, have you got a special message that you did with the footballers? Or how, 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 how did you get into the greyhounds and how do you actually motivate them? Well, I think they do the motivating. I'm sure they motivate me. Um, I got into it uh, probably 12 years ago by accident and uh, they're loving creatures. I sort of didn't have any activities in those days. Football was gone. I wasn't playing golf. I was working seven days a week. It was another outlet for me and um, a very loving animal. And I've, I've had a bit of success and I'm now breeding. I'm on the fourth litter and uh, I've bred some fairly handy ones and um, I've now got four pups at home that, that I'm looking to um, race in the next probably eight to nine months. And... Um, I'm just hope, hopefully they're going to be as good as the 85, 86 grand final side because we'll have a lot of fun. Well, this is going to go on the net, so if they want to contact you to buy one of these dogs, we can do that. Most <laughs> certainly. More than welcome. <laughs> Paul, um, again, too, and to Jan, your wife, I'd like to, to thank her for, for giving her to us for probably 20 years or 30 years of your life and uh, all the, the football that's gone with it. I know that... Uh, as a coach, you gave me an opportunity to play first grade to get me 100 first grade games, even though I was probably two stone too light for second row. Um, playing the Kiama Sevens when we won that was memorable, and I, I agree. Uh, Brad Selby, I remember him dropping down on his left elbow with the ball tucked under his arm, and they went to water a try, and he stood up and scored under the posts. He hadn't even put the ball down. Like Not many people think to do things like that too. Mm -hmm. uh, Mickey Martin <clears throat> running through the hole of the seven side after they all jeered him for, for bouncing the ball. Uh, so there's some, some good sides, I mean, in the game in the 84 side too when we mm -hmm. played. You know, there were some good tries and things that happened to those. So I do thank you for all the, on behalf of myself for, as a person, and, and thank you for all the time you spent with Parramatta. Wish you all the best in your retirement years. I wish you the best with your uh, your dogs especially. <laughs> no, just, I still would like to know what you whisper to them, but anyway, any rate, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, one of my fondest pieces of memorabilia is an Australian jumper uh, presented to me by Andrew Leeds. That uh, was the jumper that he wore in his first test match against the All Blacks in New Zealand. And it reads to Paul Dalton for your guidance and support in my achievement. Um, something I cherish very dearly and uh, a great man, Andrew Leeds. My um, second famous piece of memorabilia is a New South Wales jumper. I'm not too sure how I acquired this, but uh, it's got number two on its back. And Eddie Jones was the hooker in that year, but uh, 
I'm not too sure whether Eddie, that'd be too big for Eddie, so it may have been someone else. Three other pieces of uh, memorabilia that mean a lot to me. Uh, the one that I'm wearing is my Parramatta blazer, premierships for 85 and 86 displayed. And on my right is my New South Wales blazer that I was presented when I coached New South Wales in 87. And the one on my left is probably one that a lot of people don't know about. 1972, I coached New South Wales Colts at the Sydney Cricket Ground.